Emmaus. coming back at you with another episode of the Emmaus Proposition. Man, it's been really good uh, to be with y'all on this journey. Thank you all who are who are subscribing and following, uh, tuning in, giving me show ideas. Man, I, I so appreciate y'all, man. I appreciate the likes. I appreciate y'all listening. I appreciate you telling folks about it. Man, it's it's an honor. It's a privilege, man. And and to get to to get to share my thoughts on any subject is I man, I appreciate y'all listening. How about that? I just I appreciate y'all tuning in, uh letting me know you're listening. I, I run into folks uh on the street and they're like, yo, I was checking out your your latest episode. Good job. Keep it going. And so I appreciate y'all and I love y'all. Today, I want to talk to y'all about this course that I took uh, this past week. So it was a three-day course. I had, I had taken the initial, um, the initial material beforehand, uh, and that was like a two-day course. And so I took that probably back in May or so. I think I talked to y'all a little bit about it because I think I was – maybe I was doing the show back then. Um, I, don't, I don't remember back that far. <laughs> I got – I got a bad memory, y'all. <laughs> but uh, this this three day one that I took was actually to become an instructor in the material, and so man, it was it, the people are awesome. The people are great. the The people that were in my little uh, table cohort, man, they they are they're killing it. And and I'm looking forward to presenting this material with them, man, as we, as we tell more and more people about it, really what the material is, it's, it's from this company called, um, Blue Courage. And what they've done, they essentially have put together material that talks about like the holistic wellness of the human being and how that, um, when, when we take care of the people, Ultimately, the people are going to take care of the organization. They're going to be more well-rested, more well-fed. Uh, they're going to be uh, closer to God uh, if they if they subscribe to God. Because, you know, we got people in the military that don't subscribe to God. and uh, Or maybe they're just more healthy spiritually. Um, when, when situations arise, we're, they're giving them tools and techniques on how to pause and think about what's what's happening so that they don't just immediately react and, and just jump into a situation. So they're giving them like tactical breathing uh, exercises and all kind of stuff, right? All in the aim to restore some some dignity and nobility to the force. Because I think what's happened over the years, and honestly, I, I don't think it's anything new. Like I was talking to one cat in class, and we were talking about how the military right now, it's kind of riding the wave of the nobility of the greatest generation. Like, so uh, post World War II, when those guys were coming home, World War I, World War II, when those guys were coming home from war, man, there was, there was parades in the streets, man. Y'all seen the pictures of the, the Navy guy coming home and grabs a girl and just kisses her in the middle of the street. There's confetti everywhere. There's... The city shuts down because of, of how proud people are of how the military performed. And ever since then, there's been like a, in some cases, a gradual decline. In some cases, like a sharp decline of people's attitude toward the military, right? And not just, not just the military. So um, the course that I took is called Purple Resolve. But Purple Resolve is just the military version of the course called Blue Courage. Blue Courage is actually, it's speaking to police officers. And even for them, they've lost some nobility. You know what I mean? Like they've, they've lost some, uh, some, of the, some of the public's uh, affirmation. Like people don't appreciate police officers and the job they do. And the same is true with the military. People don't, people don't appreciate the military. And some of it is cultural, of, of just where we are culturally. Uh, I had I had one friend of mine uh, call me, call the military a bunch of baby killers, and it was like I, I don't I don't even know what to do with that, right? Because uh, that's not that's not who we are in the military. We're not we're not baby killers at all. Um, but that's sometimes that's public perception about who the military is, and so what this course was was looking at was sometimes that's cultural 
uh, that j- just the changing nature of, of culture, like how they treated the Vietnam vets when they came back home, or spitting on them when they caught off the bus, the Korean War vets they completely forgot about, um, you know, Desert Storm, people were trashing people when they come back from Desert Storm. There's, there's all kind of attitudes that are just cultural, right? On the other hand, the military has done some stuff to itself, and we have, man, <laughs> we've gone down to places we've we've mistreated prisoners we've uh we have there's there's been some people that have flipped the lid and they've gone through and just just shot innocent people uh we've had people that were okay with collateral damage there's there's some stuff that's happened in the military there's there's been cheating scandals there's been adultery scandals it's been all across the board right and what this course was talking about was how do we restore nobility to the force like do you do you believe in the organization you're a part of or is it just a job if it's just a job maybe you should find a different job because we want to restore nobility to the force we want to restore valor we want to restore honor we want when you put on the uniform in the morning that you put it on knowing i'm about to go do something courageous and uh that's 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 a change we want to see in the military and it starts with the individual how do you see yourself when when you wake up in the morning? Do you see yourself as just going to another job, or do you, or do you see yourself as um, just a just a peon, just a, just a cog in the wheel, or or do you see yourself as noble? And so there was this one section in the course, and and there's like there's four there's like five or six different sections. It goes through like the foundations of what they mean by purple resolve. They talk about the culture of the national guard and and you know you got those those things that are um like direct culture and indirect culture and all that kind of stuff right that's not right it's it's formal and informal culture so you got those those things that are formal culture that are like laws that you have to abide by and all that kind of stuff right then you have this informal culture like what does it mean when you walk out into the civilian sector with your uniform on or do you Walk out down the street with your uniform on. How do you how do you address civilians? All those things are kind of informal culture, right? Um, it talks about the nobility of the guard. It talks about having dignity and respect, uh, resiliency and hope, and then um, positive psychology, which. Uh, I don't know about uh, that's probably part of the car uh, the part of the course that I struggle with the most because there's a lot of the power of positive thinking kind of stuff and it's real easy for wolves to latch onto that and uh, we like to call it um, toxic positivity like if you're just more happy then things will work out and <laughs> like yeah, your dog just died, but you should be excited because they're no longer in pain. Like that's that would be like toxic positivity, and and they're not after that. I I know I know where they're getting at, um, because we have something like Philippians where we come through and say like whatever's good, whatever's honorable, whatever's just, whatever's holy. Concentrate on those things. Let those things be what's on your mind on a daily basis, and let and let Christ like redeem you in, in your thought process, like through trying to concentrate on things right so i know what they're trying to get at it just sounds weird like it 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 bothers me when we talk about um positive psychology but there was there was some cool funny videos that went along with that and uh they kind of explained it well um another another section was practical wisdom just having just having morality in your job and 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 being able to speak to situations from a lens that's like morally upright and it's and it's a challenge in the military right now and and culture at large because man so many of the folks that are that are coming up right now have this idea that morality is relative values depend on the person um it's it's all this this relativism um that is as they look at a situation even if it's a bad situation they're like well I don't know if that was right or wrong. Maybe it was right for the person. Maybe it wasn't right for the person. Like we've lost the ability to just call right, right and wrong, wrong, right? 
and obviously you have to go through getting facts on that. Like you, you, you need to make sure that if you're like drawing judgments against people that you have factual evidence, not, not something that the news told you because all news agencies, they, they spin stories and stuff like that. Uh, not something that your neighbor, your, your third cousin removed, married to your second cousin, twice, twice shy of, of 40 acres. I don't know. <laughs> there's, there's, there's family and friends, right, that we, we hear what they got to say, but you should, you should always take it with a grain of salt, man. Before you pass a judgment on someone, go and investigate that stuff for yourself. And, man, it happens in the military all the time. Like somebody will get a rep when they're like a, an E1. They get a rep for something. They get a nickname for it, and that follows them all the way up until they get to like an E7, E8, E8. And the damage that it causes along the way when somebody is just, it has that negative attitude about you. <clears throat> so they they introduce stuff like positive psychology because they're like, man, we need, we need people to think well of themselves. We need them to, to think that they're the best at what they do, that they're the 1%, especially people that last like 20, 30 years in the military. Like they, they have gone above and beyond for the sake of their country. And we need them to think good about themselves so they continue to maximize their efforts for the organization so but the part i wanted to talk to y'all about and this is the part of the course that probably not that it bothered me the most but it was the it was the one that i feel like we are failing the most in especially right now the stuff we have going on in our country the stuff we have going on in the military when it comes to stuff like religious freedom the way that we're handling right now, it's actually damaging our our stance of nobility in the guard. It, it's actually lessening our, our valor. And um, I wanted to go through some of this material with y'all so y'all can see what I'm talking about. Um, and really talk through how how we see Christ in this and how... Really, the, the major way that we're going to get back to having this nobility is really having more faith, man. I'm not going to pull any punches on that part. I don't think there's a way for us to be morally relative and try to establish nobility. I, I don't think those two thoughts go together. And so let me show you all what I'm talking about. So when it talks about the nobility of the guard, right, there was this, there was this quote from Ronald Reagan. He said, and I'm not going to read the whole quote. Uh, essentially, he says, in the struggle that's going on now in the world uh, will not be bombs and rockets, but a test of will, of ideas, a trial of spiritual resolve, the values we hold, the beliefs we cherish, the ideals to which we are dedicated. So Ronald Reagan and, and you know, do what you want about his political career. I don't, I don't really care about your stance on that one, but man, he was on to something, man, like when... We are not, like, even the Bible would say, we're not battling against flesh and blood. We're, we're battling against the principalities, the, the powers that are at work. They're, they're, it's a spiritual battle, battle that's happening. Ronald Reagan was saying something, uh, like, really similar to that passage. He's talking about it's a trial of spiritual resolves. It's, it's, a, it's a test of, of will and ideas. It's capturing the minds and hearts of the people. And so when we do dumb stuff in the military, we're not, we're not like putting forth our best ideal system. We're putting forth the worst of ideas. Like when we, when we have people that are like, they're in the military and they're posing for, for nudie magazines or when we are, uh, we got a commander that knows his squadron is cheating and he decides to turn a blind eye to it. Or we have uh, this officer messing around with this enlisted person and all that stuff, man. Like when we go to another country and we say like, believe in democracy, like democratic countries don't go to war with each other. The, the best way to govern a people is to allow the people to govern themselves. And the, and the government should step back and allow them to, to live life, to flourish in life. And, and at best, if the government steps in, it's to remove any kind of barriers so that the people can have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. When we go to another country and we say that kind of stuff, but we have these internal scandals in our military, 
or when we go to another country and we say, no, we don't, we don't want you to change your religion. Keep your religion. Matter of fact, the, the basis of our constitution is religious liberty. When, when we go to another country and we say stuff like that, and then they peer inside of our military and look how we're treating our members, it damages, it damages the nobility of the force. Like it, it, it lessens it. It, it, it depreciates the value of our military. And now, like if you look in the news right now, we've got uh, a recruiting shortage. We've got retention shortages. We got people that don't want to join the military at all, or they're not, not to mention they're not, they weren't qualified, but now less and less even want to join because of the, because of how the, how folks are being treated and, and, and how their religious liberty are being stamped on. And so I think, I think Ronald Reagan was on to something there, right? Here's another quote. This one is by uh, a guy named Richard Livingston, Livingstone, because he's probably British, right? <laughs> it says this, one is apt to think of moral failure as due to weakness of character. More often it's due to an inadequate ideal. So that's, that's even saying like the times when we have like these moral failures or um, the times when they get, they gave this this uh, this quote or this they they posed this question in the course. How many military generals have been removed from their positions due to a lack of of tactical mistakes? Like they they made some mistake with their military since World War II. The answer is none, not a single one. But if we try to go through and count the number of generals that have been removed because of um scandal after scandal and moral failure after moral failure man that i don't even have that number they didn't even give us that number they just said it's it's not because of tactical stuff it's because of moral failures it's, it's because they've they've lost its nobility they've lost what it means to put on a uniform and feel proud and stick your chest out and and, and walk down the street and say to people no i'm in i'm in the i'm in the guard I'm in the military. This is a noble profession. Police officers, they have the same thing, right? How many of our police officers have, have gone through all these scandals with these shootings and stuff like that or, or taken advantage of prisoners? And, and uh, those, those, are, that, those are inadequate ideals. Th those aren't moral failures due to, due to weakness of character. They, there's, they're not bad because of those things happen. Where they fell short is they had this mindset that was off. Their spirit, their soul was off. That's, that's what these, these, uh, these statements are getting at. And then there was this other quote uh, by a guy named Rumi. He says, those who are here unfaithfully do incredible damage. Man, is that true? Think about like the police force, people who are there unfaithfully. Think about people who are in the military that are there unfaithfully. Think about even expanding that, right? Think about the pastors, that are in these positions that are there unfaithfully. Think about CEOs, maybe your your boss, wherever you work. Those people that are there unfaithfully, and not unfaithfully like, you know, they um, they're there. They kind of got in by some underhanded means. That's that's not necessarily what I mean. But those people that are simply they're just there for their own career advancement. Like pastors that go into these positions that, that just take the position because they want to ultimately get to this position. They're not there for the people. They're there for themselves. And, and when you're there unfaithfully, wherever it is, CEOs, like I said, um, police officers, military folks, if you're there unfaithfully, you can do incredible damage because it... People see you and you represent the totality of the organization you're a part of. And when you're there unfaithfully and you do unfaithful things, it damages the nobility of the place you're in. These, these are noble professions that should, be, that should be treated as such, right? And then it talked about like how the, how the guard has gone through <clears throat> the, orig the original... Um, the original thought about having a soldier, a citizen soldier, goes all the way back to Plato, the times of Plato, as he wrote the Republic, right? And it, it kind of traces through like this lineage of like um, knights of chivalry and um, how the colonies had 
the, the, the National Guard, when people were like, they were just farmers and, and, uh, and shepherds and stuff like that. But when the, when the time come for them to took up arms, they, they took up arms and defended not only their own farm, but their colony and their nation against against whatever invasion whether it was uh, native americans that were trying to that were trying to uh come in and 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 create war cuz <laughs> I, I i think that was like a two-way war right they were warring with each other and on the other side uh you had um the british when the british would invade and we needed to protect what we were trying to set up as a country the National Guard was right there, or at least those those citizen sh- soldiers were right there. Native Americans, like they they had this idea already within their tribes. Like, yes, you were a member of the tribe, but you you were called to go to war. Like that's that's what the National Guard is. That's that's nobility. That's the the lineage that we fall upon. Th- those those folks are our prodigy. That progeny prodigy. Trying to use big words and they're not landing. <laughs> Those are the folks that came before us, <laughs> and uh, and we and we owe it to them to to let the professions remain noble. People that have character. We we don't want people in these positions because they can do incredible damage, right? And here's the here's the reason why I had such a hard time with it. As I was looking at, because there's more, there's more to the material, but really where it stumped me was as it's talking about what the definition of nobility is, right? It's talking about like the greatness of character. It's talking about these high ethical qualities. It's talking about serving a cause greater than self. It's talking about faithfulness. Like nobility has these big, these big words, these big meaty words to it, right? But my one issue that I've, that I've been dealing with for the last couple years, when we talk about religious freedom. So, so when I came into the military, you stand, I remember, I remember um, when, when I first came into the military, right? I, I went down, I, was, I left home in South Carolina. I was up in D.C. I tried to go to Howard University, and y'all, it just didn't work out. Like, I... S- small town South Carolina to Washington D.C. How fast it was! Um, I was I was young and 18 years old, and so my brain only had one thing on it, and that thing was there in abundance. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, and that was that was all I thought about. I could care less about going to class. Those people over there, I need to go see who they are. And I need to go talk to him. And why am I here in school? <laughs> I just had that thought process, right? So when I finally came to my senses, I'm like, I got to do something else. And my mom was like, maybe you should go in the military. I'm like, that might actually be a really good idea. So took the ASVAB, went into uh, the Air Force. They sent me to like a medical screening thing. It's called MEPS. Uh, while we're at MEPS, we take the oath of office, right? We swear in. So I'm standing there wearing a line of people. We raise our right hand, right? And uh, they say, they they make you do the oath of office. Uh, I'm sorry, the oath of enlistment. Say, I do solemnly swear to support the, uh, um, the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign or domestic. And it goes on from there. And And that part of it. That, that, that initial line to support and defend the Constitution of the United States is at the heart of every single military member, or at least it should be. That, that's where our nobility comes from. There's nobody else in our culture that swears to support and defend the Constitution. Man, I, I, I look at, I would say politicians do, but politicians, as soon as they get in office and they close the door, they're making these backroom deals, they're doing anything but supporting and defending the Constitution. The military is supposed to be this place that's apolitical. The people that, that it's the last bastion of defense of the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic, right? And part of that Constitution, the First Amendment of that Constitution, talks about religious freedom. It's right there. The very, the very first thing we're oathing to 
is the, the support and defense of religious liberty. And so as we are, as, as we're experiencing what we're experiencing in the military, and man, uh, I'm going to drop a link down in the description, man, so y'all can see like the, the full story of what we're going through. And man, it's like a story after story of people that are like, I want to serve my God and my country, and you're making me choose between the two. They, they don't have to be mutually exclusive. But as of right now, where we are, it's being forced to be mutually exclusive. Those those two things, as as they're standing right now, people are 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 getting less and less leeway to just serve their God. That's not to say there aren't other religions that uh, that the military is supporting. Man, the amount of people that are walking around with beards, and I'm like, I mean, like glorious beards, man. Like most of them are like Norse pagans or something like that. And when I tell y'all, man, it's like these beards come sh- straight out of Viking lore. Like they're not, they're not like down to here or anything. Like they got to keep them packed in. But man, they look, they look fire. And and there's a part of me that's like, I'm I'm searching through the scriptures trying to find something where I can have a beard too. I'm like, can I take on a Nazarite vow and just not not cut any of my any of my hair? Just Give me four, give me four years of just like growing a beard and not, and I'll be happy. Right. I'm like, <laughs> I'm trying to find it and I don't think I could justify it. But, um, so other, there's other like faith groups that, that the military is okay. Um, like Sikhs are able to wear their, uh, their head, their head wrap. Um, folks in the Jewish community, they're able to wear, um, their, uh, yarmulkes, um, there's some uh, Muslim ladies that are in the force that are able to wear their full uh, burqa dress. And for some reason, right now in the military, the, the majority of the people that have said, I have a problem with what's, with what's being asked of me and I, and I need an, a religious accommodation, the majority of those people are Christians. I, I don't have an official stat on that. But the majority of those people are Christians. And so it's odd. It's strange. And when we talk about religious liberty and we talk about the foundations of the country and those those Judeo-Christian values, that's what was at the heart of the colonies was those Judeo, Judean Christian values. That's that's why people were able to stamp out slavery. Like slavery was a, a terrible thing, but the the people that were fighting the hardest against it were people of faith. Granted, there were a ton of people of faith that were okay with what was happening. But the reason it got stamped out was because of the Christian faith. The reason people were able to take up arms and support and defend their family and their country is because they were of Christian faith, man. Like you, it's it's hard to argue with with the facts of history, you know what I'm saying? And so, when we when we are trying to move away from what we've what we've established as a country, when we try to move away or we forget the oaths that we that we've taken to support and defend against all enemies, foreign and domestic. So that means if you are against people trying to have religious accommodation, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say you're a full on enemy. But man, there's some like there's some tendencies there, right? People who fight against people who fight against your liberties, we would we would we would say they, we wouldn't say they were for us. We would say they were against us. And so it's tough. It's it's tough to it's tough to talk about the nobility of the force when we have people that are they're just moral relativists, and they're talking about how uh, religion has caused all this damage over here, and how um, get your get your religion out of the government and. Uh, we got we got one dude uh, that's out in the civilian world. I think his name is like uh, Weinstein or something like that. I forget I forget what his name is, but he's he's like an atheist, and he just anytime the military does anything positive for people of faith, he's right there to say, uh, "You can't do that. That's 
that's co-mingling uh, church and state, which is which is such a such a misnomer, man. As if as if church and the separation of church and state is actually in the Constitution. If you go look right now at the Constitution, it doesn't say there should be a separation of church and state. It doesn't say that explicitly. And the reason for that is because the founders understood that we couldn't have the type of government we have without, the, without it being people of faith. So they were actually trying to protect the church from the state. That's, that's what was going on in England. The, the state um, and the church were in such a hotbed together that people of faith could no longer worship the way they wanted to under 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 state law so the government could come in and make you make you worship a particular way it's not that they were trying to stop people from being a moral people and i'm not saying that people of people who don't have faith can't have morality right i just i don't think you have a basis for morality like you're you're stealing from a christian worldview at that point the basis of morality is god itself there there can't be moral relativism there is a moral good and just God. And the reason why we have standards of, of good and just and nobility is because of his character. And so we're operating off of a, of a, of a, of a holy standard. If we, take, if we take away the standard, then it's just free game. That means your definition of nobility and my definition of nobility can be completely opposite, but both are right. I, I learned I learned in math. I wasn't I wasn't great at math in high school. But A when A equals B, then B equals A. If A does not equal B, B can't equal A. <laughs> if you if you have one thing that's that's true and right, so my worldview is true and right. You can't come along and say, well, my worldview is just as true and right. We can both be wrong. Absolutely, we can both be wrong. But you can't come along and say all truths are equal. It's just not, that's not how truth works. There's, there's one standard of truth. And that's why we have to have a God that's transcendent above all that stuff. And I think... I think that's one of the things Jesus was talking about as he's walking down this road to Emmaus, right? As Jesus in 14, uh, John 14, 6, he says, uh, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. People that are moral relativists, they hate Jesus saying something like that. They despise it because it means there's only one way to God. There's only one path to walk to righteousness and holiness and nobility and honor and valor. There's, there's only one way to get there. There's only one truth. There can't be many truths and, and reality still stand. What, what actually, when you, when you talk about like moral relativism or just relativism in general, what you're actually vying for is complete chaos. If your truth and my truth are, are equal in the same way at the same time, that's chaos. You can't have two truths. There has to be an ultimate truth that rises above all that stuff. And the truth that we have, the standard that we have, Jesus said, it's me. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. That's what, that's what we need in this world right now. I, I, think that's what, I think that's what Jesus meant as he was... Uh, as he was re-explaining it on his rock to Emmaus, I think he's actually giving them a warning. Like, yo, you're, you're going to hear all kind of stuff come up in this world. You're going you're gonna to hear all kind of false truths. And, and actually, Jesus says, many false prophets have gone out into the world. And you have to be able to distinguish what's true and what's false and have that discernment on what to follow. If something is saying that Christ is not God, that he hasn't risen from the dead, from the dead, that he's not seated at the right hand of the father, that he's not coming back for his bride. Any, anything that, that, that has that messaging to it. It's a, it's a false gospel. It's to be rejected, ran from ultimately, ultimately denied. 
And when we talk about this nobility piece, when we talk about like how do we how to regain this nobility for the force, what the greatest generation had, they have faith. They have faith in Christ. It was rampant throughout culture, throughout society. The chances of you throwing a rock and hitting an atheist were, not to say throw rocks at atheists, if you were to throw a water balloon and, and nip an atheist on the toe. <laughs> I'm not trying to bag people here, it's just an expression. The chances of you finding somebody who didn't believe in God at all were slim. 90-something percent of people believed in God around that time. And you, and you could really tell because there was a saying that came out of war, there's no atheists in foxholes. So even the people that would say, at the very least, they didn't know if there was a God, they knew he was there when those bombs start flying. Now, man, now I think, I think something like, 50% of people believe in God. Even less than that who actually trust in God. There's all kind of different offshoots that are going on. And so I, I still believe in, in religious liberty. Even if, even if I have to support you um, to, have, to have your belief system, it's, it's my job as a member of, of the service, right? But oh my goodness, when you single out a particular faith and you say we're we're not going to honor your um, we're not going to honor your accommodation. Matter of fact, we're going to call you as being too political, and you have no place in our force. That those are some of the things that are happening, and they're not. Um, it hasn't been fun. Uh, it's, it's one of our biggest hurdles right now of getting back to the nobility of force. I, I don't know what's happening in the police department. I can't speak to those guys. I don't know what their biggest hurdles are. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what the biggest, biggest hurdles are for pastors in their, in their noble professions, right? There's, there's people that struggle with all different kind of sins. I think one of the biggest sins in the pastoral realm is, uh, is this idea of there being a lead pastor, I just, I think, it, I think it's one of the biggest um, temptations that pastors face. Paul talked about a, a plurality of elders to combat against uh, having that guy, that one guy that's in charge of it. And, and people try to get fancy with the language, first among equals, or they'll say, they'll say lead pastor, or um, th there has to be somebody that has the final vote, like they, they try to get creative with it, man. But when, when you're up in that lead position, when you're out there in front and you don't have like a team of men beside you that you guys are lock armed and you're fighting against the devil. I think that's honestly, from, from my perspective, that's been the downfall of a good number of pastors. They just, they get this attitude about them as if they are, uh, as if their voice means more than the lowest congregant in the church. I think, I think God raises those men up, but I think those men need to surround themselves with other men and submit to them and not, not try to lord it over the rest of the team. But for the military, right, for the service, one of our biggest hurdles is that people have lost a sense of what it means to, to be a defender of the nation. I, and, and personally, just as from a, from a Christian perspective, I don't think we'll regain it, that nobility, until we learn how to re-rely on Christ. I, I, think, I think when we have, um, like I said, I'm not shaming other religions, but mine, I think, has the best messaging. And, and if you're a Christian, yours has the best messaging. We don't have to try to reach up to God and try to, try to reach this moral standard in order for him to look 
favorably upon us. Matter of fact, he says, no, I know the condition of your heart. I know where you stand. I know your temptations. I know you're not going to be able to withstand temptation. I get it. I don't like it. it breaks my heart. But I understand. I understand so much. And I want you and my family so bad that I'm willing to put my son into human flesh. And he's going to do so willingly because he loves you too. He's going to come in human flesh. He's going to live just like you. But because he's so good and so honorable, he's so noble, he has so much valor, the people that think they're hyper-righteous, they're going to put him to death. And the people that are super sinful are going to say, bravo, he was, he was getting too much in our Kool-Aid. But he's going to die so that you don't have to. He's going to experience temptation, death. He's going to experience what it's like to be hated upon, to, sp to be spit on. To be shamed. He's going to take all that. So that. When the time comes. For you to meet me face to face. And this is from God's perspective. When it comes time for you to meet me face to face. I won't have to look at you and say. I never knew you. You can actually come to me now. We can be cool. You can be my son. I can give you an inheritance. But if you reject my son. After he did all that for you, I will cast you aside. Until we can get back to that knowledge, to that wisdom, to that nobility, claiming the nobility of Christ for ourselves. We're not going to make it, man. And, and it's just going to continue to get worse. And I don't know if y'all have looked around, man, but things aren't going so hot. Some things are on the rise that shouldn't be on the rise. We've, we've, got, we've got people giving TED Talks about how um, people that are attracted to children shouldn't be called pedophiles. That's too offensive. They should be called youth attracted. We're, we're, we're in a spot. We're in a spot, y'all. And, and, if, and if that, and if the, the protection of children... If we can't even agree on the protection of children, not even going to protection of children in the womb, we can't even agree upon the protection of children right now. I, I don't, I don't know. We we have to restore nobility. It's I, because I'm here in the military. I think we can we can lead as the example of what that means. But the, but the way we do it. God's going to have to be in the center of it. He's the only one that could bring the dead back to life. And so it was a really good course though, man. And I look forward to teaching it. Um, I look forward to uh, seeing people change because there's a lot of folks. What, what the biggest thing that they're trying to prevent is these people that they go through this, this life and, they don't understand the organization they're a part of. They don't know how their their honorable soul fits into the organization. They they don't even consider themselves as honorable. They're trying to just wake up day by day and just make it. And a lot of folks, when they don't get there, suicide is just right on the horizon. And and it's it's like the longer you live into that negative that negative lifestyle, the longer you can't see yourself or how honorable and noble you are suicide you, you, you're inching closer and closer to suicide as as god told um as god told cain man the devil is right there he's waiting for you he wants you he's knocking at the door he's crying out for you and um man whatever we can do to heal this the stain of suicide in the military, man. I I'll teach this material all day long. Um, but what but what ultimately I think we need to get to that that will ultimately heal and get us back to that nobility that we had 
as as soldiers and airmen and um, naval folks, Marines, Coast Guard, Space Force. When the thing that we need to get back to that level of nobility that we had after World War II, for all the warriors across all the services, is to come back to Christ. He's the way, the truth, and the life. So that's my episode for today, y'all. I hope y'all enjoyed it. Uh, I look forward to talking about whatever subject, man, and leading us back to Christ. That's what we do here at the Emmaus Proposition. And I love y'all, man. Hit me up with some show ideas. Let me know if you want to come on and chop it up. I'd love to have some folks on. Um, Please continue to spread the word on what we're doing out here. I love y'all. Hope y'all doing well. Thank y'all for tuning in on the podcast. Thank y'all for subscribing and listening over on YouTube. Yo, I'm over on Rumble. Y'all go check that out. Um, It ain't a political thing. It's reaching as many people as I can for Christ, man. That's what we're here doing. So I love y'all. Tune in next time. And until then, grace and peace.